So here I've got a mass spring damper system that I'm using a little, I guess you can call it a differential analyzer, analog differential analyzer to calculate. I don't know if you can really call this an analog computer. It doesn't fit the Turing definition, but then again, most analog computers actually don't fit that definition. It really fits digital computers. But anyway, if a mass, a spring, and a damper, and it's expressed by this differential equation here, and you have, you know, F equals MA, you know, the, the, the spring equation, you have the spring constant, and the stiffness of the spring, and then, of course, you also have the damper and its constant. The thing I should mention is the second derivative of Y is acceleration, the first derivative is speed, and the first is uh, distance. So Y is basically distance with respect to T, time. T is the only independent variable, is the independent variable that is the only independent variable you can use in these analog analyzers, basically. There's other systems that can make use of multiple independent variables, but in, the, in this case, time is your only variable that you can actually play with in that way. Everything in this equation is with respect to time. That's sort of implied. Yeah, so in this case, acceleration is equated to the second derivative of distance, and the first derivative of distance is speed, basically. And so using... Uh, you know, some integrator, some, some components here, we can model this equation, the mass, the stiffness, and the damping, by some electronic components here. So we end up solving different things. We end up solving for uh, the second derivative of y using a particular, I think it's called the Kelvin feedback technique or something. And it works in this particular situation because if this particular part of the equation is equated to y prime prime divided by m, the mass. So in essence, you have this, this feedback loop of an equation. This schematic here just shows an integrator circuit. Um, it's not exactly the type I'm using here, but it's the same idea where you have an input. The input's not switched in this case, but you do have what's called an initial condition switch. So you can set an initial condition preload that and pre-charge the capacitor and then when you want to run the equation I have a switch here set in this feedback loop to close this loop and it will release that that mass and the damped spring system will move and I have some you know starting values here that I kind of started with and I've since tweaked it <clears throat> and of course the speed at which this solves the equation is dependent on this capacitor size uh, and of course this resistance too. And so I ended up using a single shot, like portable oscilloscope to capture what is going on here. That being this thing. This is the actual computer itself. As you can see, kind of just a rat's nest. Uh, these, these run on a plus minus 15 volts. So you can set it at whatever. These are basically buffered attenuators so that the resistances of the inputs and outputs don't affect the attenuation level. They're totally independent. That is like, I guess you can call it the start switch. These are the initial condition switches. So you'd like hold those down, let them go, and then press the start switch and it will solve the equation once. To solve it multiple times, you'd have to reset those initial conditions, then press the switch again. And there's really not much to it. It's literally just a bunch of op amps configured as integrators. The integrators are right here. You've got a mixer right here. These are dual op amps, TLO 72s. I think this is the, uh, this is S, the, or yeah, this is the spring stiffness, the damping, and the mass is this lower one. And then this top one here, I believe is the, is Y prime naught, which is the first initial condition. Right there, and then the second one is is that one. This one is the displacement of the displacement of the spring. So if you're pulling the mass down, how far you pull it down to begin with, that's that initial condition. I think this other one is like how far the damper is pressed or something like that. I'm not entirely sure. I'll press the one shot button on here, so it's now waiting for a signal. So I'm pressing the initial condition buttons. Let's run it. 
so it starts, as you can see, kind of at the bottom, and then it runs up and then stops as this damped oscillation. Now I'm gonna turn down the damping here, and I'm gonna show you what happens when you have less damping. I'm just gonna turn this a few turns. I'm not going by exact numbers here. So as you can see, if, if I increase the damping, it runs for a bit longer. If I decrease the spring stiffness, it sort of starts out bigger and then decreases. The frequency kind of remains the same, though. It depends on, well, it actually depends on a few things. Depends on the mass, depends on the stiffness. We can tweak all these values real time, basically. Well, kind of. So I was just playing with the initial conditions there, the uh, initial displacement. Like where, where on the, the spring movement the mass is placed before it's let go. And as you can see, uh, it starts on the top rather than the bottom, depending on where you, where you set that. So as you can see, you can play with the equation, not quite in real time, almost. You can, you can simply set the parameters and solve it, and it solves it like almost instantly. And it very well describes this mass spring system. As you can see here, if you turn the damping way up, you get what's called a critically damped oscillation where it starts out, it bounces a little bit, and then returns to equilibrium. 